I mean, the idea that a child should be sitting quietly working by themselves, um, well, it's ludicrous to suggest that that is by itself some kind of a, a oppressive and tyrannical thing to ask a child. That should be a perfectly normal thing to ask a child. Hello, I'm Tom Rogers, and this is the Rebel Education Podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's Rebel Education Podcast. I'm Tom Rogers at Rogers History on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in. This week we're discussing the birth of the Ban the Booths campaign. It was launched last week to much fanfare on social media. The main aims of the people involved that include Paul Dix and Jules Dalby is to ban the booths. They want the removal of deep confinement booths in all schools, the regulation and reporting of all children isolated for more than half a day in schools, and funding to support schools in shifting from isolation booths to better practice. Um, My immediate response to this was, in my experience, um, number one, it's often necessary that children are removed from classrooms for a range of reasons, and I don't think there'll be anybody who would disagree with that. Well, I'd hope not. Secondly, those children who are removed need to go somewhere, and quite often they can't go into another classroom because either there isn't another teacher available or they might disrupt the learning in that other classroom. So they need to go somewhere else, especially if it's a more serious uh, offence or something has happened. Um, usually a school will have a room. Now, if there is a room that is manned by either teachers or support staff, um, then that room needs to be controlled. It needs to be a safe space. Um, It is a sanction. Let's not forget that. I mean, um, there is an argument that it's not... that that I I know that um, Paul Dix, um, writing in the TES... Uh, said the following. Um, He said, Punishment can multiply in an isolation room. Extra days given for the smallest infractions. We need to limit punishment in schools to ensure that it does not become disproportionate, to make sure that it's in line with our values, our laws, and the rights of the child. Well, for me, I mean, if, if if a student has been removed from a classroom because they're impacting on the learning of 29, 30 other students... We have to think of every student in the school, not just those students who've been removed from classrooms. Every single person is equal in this equation. The child has usually done something wrong to have been removed from the classroom and and usually to be put into an isolation room, it would have to be something relatively serious or at least you would hope so. And this is where I do join those who are concerned that they're being used kind of willy-nilly. I accept that, but you have to understand that Schools in deprived areas are under huge amounts of pressure. There are incidences of poor behaviour cropping up a lot of the time, all the time. And having a so-called exclusion room, and I don't, or an isolation room, and I don't like those words. Uh, it's a room away from the other students for a hopefully a very short period of time. But I think it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary to separate that student from other students for a period of time if they've been involved in a fight if the if there is an issue that just just they need to be removed from that situation for their own benefit but you know also for the benefit of everybody else and when they get into that room as i've said it is a sanction first and foremost but secondly if you have a, a normal sized classroom type room and you have 10 students in there who've all been excluded from lessons you don't want them to be communicating with each other. So the idea of a booth, for me, is a divider between uh, chairs. And yes, I think it is often helpful if the students are facing a wall because it, it will decrease the distraction that they have in that situation. Um, the dividers, yes, I think it will help them not to be distracted. And I think it will help them not to be tempted to turn around to their peers and and perhaps create more disruption when 
the sanction has already escalated because remember, nobody wants them to be in there. Um, they're in there because it, there's been a, a trail of kind of uh, problems. And, you know, they've gone through warnings and sanctions and they've ended up in there. I saw one teacher talking on social media, talking about when they were a child. And the one time they ended up in the so-called isolation room was the moment they changed their behavior. Because in that room, it's not like a normal classroom. You you can't communicate. And I know it's been criticized, again, that, you know, upping the sanction if they communicate in the isolation room. But there has to be a bat stop. There has to be a bat stop for me. This is my opinion. There has to be a bat stop in there um, somewhere on, on behavior. And, you know, we talk about the rights of the child. Yes, the rights of all children to an education. If a child, if one particular child is is um, stopping the education of a couple of hundred other children, then they're obstructing the rights of 200. So where, where do we, what do we say? Are we saying their rights are more important than the other? I don't know. But anyway, you know, rights of children and rights of teachers, rights of teachers to be able to teach in the classroom. But I, to be fair to them, I think, you know, okay, I've read out that quote about punishment as a general thing about punishment. But yes, I think the main part of this campaign is about the isolation booths themselves and the fact they should be removed or banned. Um, again, though, is it about pragmatism? Is it about saying, you know, if a school feels that's the best environment for me, you know, if they're in there for a couple of hours and they're not allowed to talk and it is a sanction and while they're in there, they are given some proper work to do and they're not allowed to communicate with their peers. And it might be that they miss a break time. It might be that they miss a lunch time, whatever. But, you know, there needs to be sanctions here. There needs to be a bit of a tough line sometimes, especially in different contexts. You know, we've all taught... I've I've taught eight years in comprehensives and three years in a British international private school. Completely different context. There's no need for anything like a quiet room or an isolation room in my current school. Yes, there are instances of low-level disruption, as there are anywhere, but there's no need for that kind of room. But in the previous two or three schools that I worked in, yes, there absolutely was. Because, you know, once all options are exhausted, that's where this, this, this room is needed and necessary, and there has to be rules within it, in my opinion. So I, I think that's my view on it. Um, and they, they talk about the regulation and reporting of all children isolated for more than half a day. That I agree with. That bit, I agree with that. I mean, you know, I think it should be recognised. OK, these are the students who have been excluded from lessons for more than half a day. Fine. But, you know, the debate of no child should be excluded for more than a certain amount of time. I'm not so sure if, if that's what the school and the community deems is is what needs to happen for the benefit of all students then i think it does and sometimes sanctions can have a really positive in, you know punishments i hate to use the word but this day it seems that punishments is a nasty word these days but punishments and discipline and sanctions can have a very positive effect on students you know much more so than a pro in my experience much more so than a discussion or restorative justice in many circumstances i'm not saying all the time Um, I would like to think you can perhaps have a mix of both. But again, it's this dichotomy of yes, no on the booths and yes, no on restorative justice and yes, no on sanctions. You know, I just feel as though we need to be a bit more pragmatic and we need to look maybe a bit more in the middle, in that grey area in the middle ground. That's what, to me, that's what education is. It's that grey area in the middle ground. Sometimes there just isn't an answer, one answer. And saying ban the booths everywhere... mm, I don't know. I just feel as though in some schools it's going to be really helpful to have those booths in place. Uh, Funding to support schools in shifting from isolation booths to better practice is the third part of the campaign. But again, better practice is surely subjective. You know, there were people saying there's no evidence to say that isolation booths improve behaviour. Well, yeah, but there's no evidence to suggest that not having them improves behaviour either. As far as I'm aware, I'd love somebody to point out all the evidence here. But, you know, this is my argument. Um, I think it's an interesting campaign. I think I respect greatly uh, the people who are putting this forward. They're obviously doing this uh, for the benefit of those who are perhaps in, in sat there in, in exclusion rooms or isolation booths for ages and um, and so on. And it is for the benefit of, of the child. I get that. But for me, it's also about the reality of education in many, many schools. Um 
that this cannot happen. And I know there are others who share my view. We're going to hear from uh, from Tom Bennett very, very soon. But also uh, Caroline Barlow, writing for the TES, said, until now, I've largely stayed out of the recent debate on isolation booths. Um, an over-focus on the use of booths as a physical entity rather belies the importance of the approaches used in and around them, approaches that can feed into the whole school ethos, culture and approach to behaviour management, she says. Uh, In truth, I do believe there is a role for isolation rooms in mainstream schools and that it is sensible that arrangements are made to ensure that students within them are seated in such a way as to not be a distraction to each other. And that's where I agree with Caroline wholeheartedly. Uh, She says it's perfectly sensible to remove students from from the mainstream classroom For two simple reasons. Firstly, so the students themselves experience consequences of their actions, uh, but also so the school continues to function successfully. Um, For us at our school, internal removal or exclusion is used as part of an overall approach to behaviour. And it's always with clarity with the students and the parents as to why they've been placed there. Uh, It's never for more than a day or two at most. And it's part of an escalating approach to, to, to a pattern of behaviours. And this is what I was saying earlier. It's, it has to be serious, in my view, in my experience of 10 years in schools. It has to be serious to get to the isolation room. And then it has to be doubly serious for them to stay in there for more than a few hours. If they're staying in there for a day or two, it's got to be for a, a, a pretty... It's, I mean, nine. I, I have not experienced a time when it's not been for something significant, if that's going to happen. And that, as Caroline says, could be a pattern of behaviour over time that's been recorded, parental meetings and so on and so forth. And, and, and sometimes it's the last resort. And, you know, and as I said, it is about a whole school approach. What about the other students? She carries on. She says, of course, any internal exclusion will be accompanied by associated pastoral support and restorative work. And this is what I mean by a bit of both. For me, this is the this is the approach. Um, isolation or internal exclusion, however it's managed, plays an important part in the management of exclusions. And she carries on. Let's have a look at some of the reactions on social media. We've had a parent saying, this is brilliant. I completely agree with Ban the Booths. Exclusion and isolation did not in any way support my son at school to become any better behaved, and this happened from eight years upwards. He was then put into various referral units, which again exclude. And this parent has used the hashtag hidden disability. Uh, Somebody else on the other side of the fence said, Hi there, behaviour consultants who believe in ban the booths. Sack off your cushy number, put on a suit and go back into the classroom she fled. Teach in a difficult school for a couple of years and then maybe you're in a position to talk. Otherwise, get back in your box. I'm guessing there was some kind of pun intended there. Um, Anyway, another one. Um, Hi, idealism. Nice of you to stop by and visit us here in the real world. I don't think you've met my friend pragmatism. Um... And finally, another one, I'm not going to offer my opinion on the ban the booths debate. However, I'm incredibly, incredibly shocked at some people's inability to concede they may not be completely positive or completely negative. Is anything in education really black and white? Um, Now, obviously, Paul Dix, um, writing in the same TES article, puts across the opposite uh, point of view. Uh, And he says there is good practice in many removal rooms. Adults work calmly with angry and frustrated children who struggle to follow direction. And then there are removal rooms where children sit in isolation booths, abandon their education on hold. Uh, Often these are not children with the worst behaviour. They are those who are irritatingly stretched the lines of tolerance. Not sure I completely agree there. Um, Sometimes maybe, but uh, yeah. I don't know. They stare into space day after day, same faces, same stories, same unmet needs. I once met a child who had spent 35 days in an isolation booth in three months. This isn't an education. It's more like a custodial sentence. Um, and then he, he goes on to say, I've seen too much not to speak out, wasted lives, wasted education. We need to ban the isolation booths. Self-electing to sit in a booth in a library is a free choice, but confinement booths are different. There is no dignity for the child. It's a very interesting debate, isn't it? I mean, I've said my opinion on it. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Tom Bennett. Absolutely delighted to have Tom on the podcast. I want to thank him so much for coming on uh, to give his opinion, because uh, I know he hasn't been well and he's taken a bit of time out to uh, to record this quick uh, opinion piece for the Rebel Education Podcast. Let's hear what Tom has to say. So what did I think of the Bad the Booths campaign? I um, <clears throat> apologise for my, my sore throat voice here. Um, I think it was very well meant. I think the people behind it had good intentions, but I think it was a quite, quite an inane 
project to try and undertake. I mean, schools have removed pupils from classrooms since time immemorial, and there's frequently very good reasons to do so. Now, that then leads you to the next question, which is, what do you do with them once you remove them? Well, then, it makes perfect sense that the, the children are, at least temporarily, parked somewhere. In some schools, for example, that's done in a classroom, but more frequently it's done in a specially designed, designated zone within the school. So let's call that a removal room rather than an isolation room, because, of course, the word isolation suggests that they are by themselves. <clears throat> And almost exclusively they're not. They're supervised by an adult, and very frequently they're there with other students too. So the word isolation is quite misleading. Um, but then the campaign seemed to fixate on the fact that people were in booths. Now, there's lots of reasons why you might take a child out of a classroom. Um, some of them nurturing, some of them supportive, some of them educational, and some of them might just be for a sanction. Now, unless you're completely against the idea of a sanction... The argument that perhaps children should have to spend a little bit of time reflecting on their behaviour and working silently by themselves shouldn't be too shocking. Nor should it be seen as being excessively punitive. I mean, the idea that a child should be sitting quietly working by themselves, um, well, it's ludicrous to suggest that that is by itself some kind of a, a oppressive and tyrannical thing to ask a child. That should be a perfectly normal thing to ask a child. Um, I mean, we're frequently asked to perform in such circumstances ourselves when we're studying or when we're in libraries or when we're sitting quietly listening to a film or music or listening to a speaker. So sitting quietly isn't by itself a particular punishment. And then the campaign seemed to move on to this idea that it wasn't so much the fact that there was dividers between the desks that was the issue, it was the height of the divider and the fact that they, they couldn't see anything other than the booth itself. Well, <clears throat> This seems another odd thing to say, that the, the main point behind the campaign was the size of the furniture involved. And this is why I say this isn't uh, an adult or mature debate to be having with an education. We shouldn't be arguing whether or not it's OK to take students out of classrooms for a short period of time and ask them to work independently by themselves or in a room with adults and other people. Um, it's perfectly valid to have a discussion about what happens to the child subsequent to that. So, for example, for many children, uh, a short, mild sanction is all they need to remind themselves that they should be behaving. In other circumstances, it might be a place where the children can go for some quiet time and for some thinking time, and that can be useful too. But of course, there's lots of things you can do with a child outside of the classroom you can't do inside of the classroom. And that's why you could use something like a removal booth or a removal room. And in addition to that, you could also have counselling, therapy, conversations, threshold moments, and so on. As, a, as I say, a kind of magazine response to, to the behaviour. So, arguing over which furniture we should use is the kind of argument that I'd rather hope we'd put behind us decades ago, but clearly we haven't, and as long as we haven't, then it's something we need to robustly defend as being a perfectly normal part of any mainstream school's repertoire. Not as a first port of call, certainly the not as the only response, but as Please one of a magazine of responses. And as you can hear, I'm coming into Petersburg. OK, thanks very much. Bye. Thank you to Tom. Um, some really interesting points there made. Uh, I generally agree with him. I generally, my view is I agree with Tom. However, I know there'll be lots of people out there who disagree with Tom and disagree with me on this. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Please uh, tweet me at Rogers History. Uh, please tweet about the podcast. Uh, tag me in if you do. Um, would love to hear a range of opinions. Uh, this is a very heated topic, I think, on social media. I can't remember a topic that's got us as uh, the blood boiling quite so much as this on both sides. But again, I personally prefer a pragmatic approach, you know, and uh, I think it's really helpful when we look at the bigger picture, when we, we try and find some balance in, in, in the conversations we're having about this this kind of thing. Um, but fair play, you know, I think it's good that this this stuff is brought, is, is brought to the highlight, if you like, and people can discuss it and think about it a bit more. So uh, that was the Rebel Education podcast for this week. Next week, we're talking about book recommendations for 2019. Got some amazing guests actually next week, uh, including Kate Jones and Jill Berry. So look out for that next Thursday. I'm very privileged uh, on the podcast to have had people like uh, Catherine Verbal Singh, Tom Bennett, Jill Berry, and many, many others come on, and Ross McGill and, and so on come on the podcast. It's been absolutely amazing to, to have these people come on, and uh, I feel really privileged that they've uh, chosen to, to spend a bit of time with me, really. Uh, 
talking on the podcast. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope you're enjoying listening. Um, I've certainly enjoyed making the podcast so far. So I'll see you next week. Bye all.